Welcome to this episode of Crops TV, The Conservation Conversation, a session dedicated to shedding light on important conservation issues and efforts going on in the state that involve soil, water, and wildlife and habitat resources. I'm Jamie Benning, the Assistant Director for Ag and Natural Resources Extension with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. Uh, with me today are great colleagues uh, with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach that are involved in conservation uh, research and extension efforts. First, Matt Helmers, Professor and Extension Agricultural Engineer and Director of the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Catherine DeLong, Extension Water Quality Program Manager. Adam Jenke, Associate Professor and Wildlife Extension Specialist. And Mark Licht, Associate Professor and Extension Cropping Systems Specialist. Clean water, Healthy and productive soils and abundant wildlife are important to Iowans. In our discussion today, we'll spend time on major initiatives and issues in major areas of water, wildlife, soils, and cropping systems. In each of these areas, we'll discuss some progress and where we have more work to do in Iowa. Mark, I think the first question will go to you. So what are some of the major challenges and concerns related to soil erosion and soil health that you're seeing? Yeah, soil erosion, it's a, it's a big issue in, this, in the state. It's as big an issue in, in many states. Um, we know that as long as we have erosion, we're going to have water quality issues. Um, you know, just as we think of erosion and what, what those water quality impacts are, it's, it's sediment um, in, in the water bodies, um, so sedimentation, but it's also clarity issues. Um, and then we're also thinking about uh, phosphorus losses, as that phosphorus is tied to the, um, the sediments. And so we know that as long as we have erosion occurring, we're going to have, um, you know, water quality issues in lakes, rivers, uh, and streams, right? Um, as we think about tying it together from a soil health perspective, uh, typically what we find is that um, improvements in soil health so, um, come with things like no tillage or strip tillage, uh, use of cover crops. Um, those are the same practices. Those infield practices are, are the same ones that are going to help us reduce soil loss. Um, and so that's a, a really good benefit, a good way to link the two of those together. And then that brings with it um, resiliency and crop production as well. All right. We talk about soil erosion and whether it is a rate that's greater than what we can rebuild um, by our practices or if we're exceeding that rate. So where do we stand in terms of soil erosion, soil loss um, per acre in the state? Yeah, so right now the estimate is, is we're right around 5.2 tons per acre per year from, from what we're losing. Um, the tolerable level that we all probably learned in textbooks at some point through our education, that, that tolerable level is about five tons per acre per year. So we have made tremendous progress in, in reducing that down, right? Um, now, while I can give us you know, some praises, I'll also give you a little bit of the bad news is, well, Mother Nature doesn't create it as fast as the tolerable level even. So uh, Mother Nature uh, is creating soil at roughly a half ton per acre per year. So that, that, that's quite a bit um, um, of a difference there, right? Um, I, I like the uh, saying that I've heard um, Dr. Rick Cruz um, say many times, and, and I'm guessing some of our guests have probably heard this <laughs> before too, um, but he says that, you know, for every pound of corn that we produce, we're losing about 1.2 pounds of soil. And just to kind of put, put things in a little bit of perspective from, from that standpoint. Um, but these erosion rates are really different across the state. And, and the Daily Erosion Project does a really good job of illustrating kind of where those um, higher rates of erosion are at, um, basically all throughout the Lust Hills in western Iowa. And then as you look up in uh, the um, Paleozoic area up in Northeast Iowa, right? So it, those, those are two critical areas. Um, but having said that, you know, even as we look at North Central and Central Iowa where it's relatively flat, we still have some pretty decent erosion rates there at times. And so it's, it's not just uh, kind of pointing the finger at, you know, the, the, the high risk areas. Everyone has to kind of pay attention to it. Yeah, we're getting into what we call maybe snert season. So uh, even in the flat areas of the state, we do see evidence of soil loss. So it's important to think about this all across the state, not just in our uh, areas where there's maybe more highly sloping or more hills. Uh, so as we think about um, how we manage soil, you've talked a bit about infield practices and helping reduce erosion. During that time, we've made those changes. We've also seen some shifts in weather patterns. So we're seeing maybe fewer storm events, but 
those um, events are more intense. So how are Iowa's soils and cropping systems holding up to some of those changes that we're seeing in weather? Yeah, rainfall intensity and just frequency in general um, are big factors in how much erosion we get, especially from a water erosion standpoint. Um, and, and maybe to highlight that a little bit, if you know, we think back to the drought of 2012, um, the average erosion loss was roughly 1.4 tons per acre. Um, whereas just a couple years later, we had much more rainfall and all of a sudden we were looking at about 12 tons per acre. So there's a, a big difference. We, and, you know, part of that's just as you have saturated soils, you know, any rainfall that you have, not only you get the detachment, but you're, you're washing away more of it as well. Um, dry soils, we don't have that rainfall, so we don't have the detachment, we don't have the runoff. Um, and so that's, that's part of it, right? Um, and so then we just have to think about how are these climate shifts, you know, of, of impacting things um, and just recognizing that, you know, we can't always predict what the weather is going to do. And so one of the safer things to do is, is try to use these infield practices to hold that soil in place. Mark, can you talk a little bit more about drought? And, you know, we've had a couple of years of drought, sometimes severe drought in different parts of the state. How are our cropping systems holding up? What is the resiliency of these systems like? Yeah, by many standards, you know, we've had drought, you know, of some level, um, some portion of the state for about the last four years. And so we, we've been getting this question. And um, unfortunately, it's a, a little bit harder to kind of parse apart, right? You know, how um, erosion and, and drought uh, may be impacting things, right? But we know that um, infield practices that build soil health means that we're increasing our soil organic matter. Um, we're increasing infiltration, soil structure, some of those types of things. And what this really leads to is that we're increasing some of that resiliency through um, available water, right? And so um, generally speaking, um, in mild to moderate droughts, no-till, um, a lot of those infield practices, you know, those systems perform a little bit better than a conventional tillage system where we don't have the structure, we've broken some of that down so we don't get the infiltration, we may not have the same water holding capacity, right? So we, we know that that's the case um, by and large, right? But we know that there's also situations where um, some of those things fall apart. You know, you get wheel traffic, you get into some marginal areas, all of a sudden now um, you may not see some of those differences uh, nearly as much. Are there any advancements in technology that are making some of these infield practices and, and changes within the field to be more resilient to these shifts in, in weather, um, climate shifts, uh, easier to incorporate or um, maybe cheaper than maybe they were in the past? We're really lucky in, in the sense that our equipment manufacturers have helped us with this uh, quite a bit, right? So we know that our planters now can perform very well in a wide variety of environments. Um, new planters, you're changing settings, you know, planter settings from the cab. You don't have to get out and, and check, oh, what's seed depth? What, you know, how, how much compaction may or may, may be getting that type of stuff, right? Um, so we can, we can very easily uh, change those planter settings to get good planter performance. Um, there's a lot of aftermarket parts as well that um, we can put on um, for residue management or to help us with closing the row, things like that. Um, following on with that, right, combines are much better than they, they ever have in the, been in the past, right? We know that we're, um, as yields have increased, we're harvesting and we have more biomass that we're trying to, to process. And, and from a high residue system like no tillage or strip tillage, that combine is really our first opportunity and maybe our only opportunity to process residue. And so th those equipment manufacturers have done us a lot of favors in, in moving into high residue systems. Um, when we think about perennial systems or uh, double cropping, relay cropping, some of the longer rotation type things, um, I don't think there's been quite the innovations around those to make those um, easier to adopt, essentially. Um, how we have to approach those is really look at how do we get livestock back onto the farm, right? Having livestock added back into the farm, we now have a forage um, use, right? Right there. Um, looking for niche markets for small grains or some of these other crops. Um, again, it's probably not that we're gonna have one small crop across you know, the state of Iowa, but if we have a lot of niche markets, now all of a sudden it opens the door to having longer rotations. 
Um, and those things are really going to help us um, in the long run, both on the water quality side, but you know, on the soil erosion, soil productivity side of things. Sure, and adding enterprises on the farm and, mm -hmm. and um, economic productivity in the state. So all sorts of avenues that are, um, have potential. Yep. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about drought. Um, we know we'll swing back to having more uh, water than we'd like in some years. So Matt, with that discussion of having more water, uh, we think of potential for losing nitrate um, via tile drainage, and that definitely remains a big issue in Iowa. So what changes are farmers and landowners making as they consider upgrades to existing tile systems or maybe as they're expanding uh, existing tile that they have a um, number of acres that they're draining on their farms? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think one thing to start with, maybe as we think about this nitrate loss, is that you know really if we're growing corn and soybeans, whether we have a tile drained soil or non-tile drained soil, we are losing nitrate. But then that the tile drained areas, there's delivery um, of that nitrate right to the stream. And so there's been a lot of work thinking about what we can do with our, our drainage systems as we design those or manage those uh, to try to reduce some of the nitrate loss. And so there's, there's been work on controlled drainage where we manage the outflow of that, that drainage system during the the summer and winter uh, time period, we kind of need pretty flat land, maybe a 0.5 to 1% slope for that. So maybe not implemented, definitely not implemented real broadly. We have a lot more acres that could uh, implement controlled drainage, but with that, we could reduce some of the, the drainage outflow and nitrate outflow from that. There are some producers also looking at uh, shallower drainage placement. And so, you know, traditionally in Iowa, a lot of our uh, infield laterals are placed at four foot depth, uh, but there's some work, uh, we've done some work um, looking, and there's been some work in Minnesota looking at shallower drain placement, maybe two and a half or three foot depth. And that work has shown that we can reduce um, nitrate loss coming out of that drainage system. So we have less water uh, and less nitrate coming out of the drainage system. And there are some contractors that are that have been looking at that. I uh, have talked to a couple contractors that that's what they implement with their with their uh, landowners and and their clients as as they think about doing this. It's also say that there's uh, work going on on edge of field practices as well. So intercepting that tile drainage water, uh, looking at trying to um, denitrify some of that water before it gets to the stream as well. So uh, that's kind of another area that farmers are looking at as they think about their, their drainage systems and how they manage that to try to reduce nitrate delivery to downstream water bodies. So you mentioned that you need a really flat field to make this work. Could you give me an estimate of how many acres in the state might be suitable for controlled drainage? Yeah, that's a good Very question. Ballpark. Yeah, yeah. I think we, you know, we have 24 million acres in the state. We have uh, about 12 million acres um, uh, of that's estimated to benefit from uh, artificial subsurface drainage or tile drainage based on the, the last, some of the eggs egg census data as well as some of the uh, kind of soils information, we might be talking about a half a million to a million acres uh, for, for controlled drainage, I, I think, uh, somewhere in that range. So, you know, it's, it's going to depend and it's going to depend on, on individual fields. Uh, so maybe, you know, that controlled drainage, uh, not as many acres applicable, shallower drainage placement, we might have a, a larger um, number of acres applicable to, to that practice. Uh, so you know, traditionally, uh, traditional systems, uh, tile drainage systems are to enhance productivity. Are there any benefits or productivity um, enhancements with drainage, um, controlled drainage and shallow drainage? Yeah, that's a good question. That would be like the holy grail that we find that, you know, there's some nitrate reduction benefits as well as yield benefits. Um, our work in Iowa, we've not really seen that. Uh, there's some work, we've been part of a regional project um, looking at that, and in certain years, we may see a, um, a small yield benefit of that, of that controlled drainage, uh, and maybe some uh, re reduced variability in yield. Um, so I think it's gonna be very year dependent. I don't think we could count on it for, you know, year to year substantial yield benefit. Uh, it, and in these cases, we're not putting water back into that drainage system. We're just trying to store what would have otherwise been lost right directly from that field. Matt, could you tell us about like what the exemplary farmers are doing as they start to think about nutrient loss on their farm? You said 500,000 acres or so for controlled drainage. What about the rest? Like what's the kind of like best case scenario or the 
the bright spots in the system. Yeah. So, and that, you know, that controlled drainage, that's like maybe what's feasible. That's not what's out there right now. We have a long way to go. And, but I think that we have, um, you know, as we look at maybe the last 10 years and thinking about reducing nitrate loss, I think we have some success stories about practices that have been developed and now farmers are out there implementing. I mentioned edge of field practices and really we're thinking about saturated buffers, uh, denitrification bioreactors, primarily wood chips, although there's emerging work looking at corn cobs and, and maybe some more going in there. Uh, we have multi-purpose oxbows and nitrate removal wetlands. And I'll talk about another one here, here in a second. But, you know, those four practices are, are practices that have really been developed over the last 10 to 15 years. A lot of the really seminal work in those areas on those practices has been done at Iowa State University. So I think that's a, that's a success story for us. And so I think farmers are starting to to think about those and implement those. You know, where can we, if we have a, a stream and a buffer, can we put in a saturated buffer? If we have tile drained acres, could we put that denitrification bioreactor? Or if we're next to a stream and we have a, you know, oxbow, could we restore that oxbow and, and route that drainage water in there? Or look at, you know, the, the wetland systems to route drainage water or surface and subsurface flow into a, a wetland. So I think all of those practices are ways that, that we can use the edge of field and take that drainage water and remove the nitrate. And I think we're seeing you know, some farmers uh, implementing those practices. We have so much work yet to do, uh, but we are starting to see you know, maybe a, uh, improve understanding that we need to implement those practices and then looking at what, what might work on their individual land. One of the newest practices that we're looking at that kind of gets back to, is there a yield benefit to this, is thinking about drainage water recycling. And I like to use the analogy in, in a way, it's like a rain barrel on steroids. So, you know, folks that have rain barrels on their, on, you know, at their property, whether they're urban or ag, might have a rain barrel. We're thinking about this very scaled up. And so, you know, we get excess precipitation in most years, although the last few years, not so much in the spring of the year. And we lose, you know, we let that water and nutrients go downstream. Could we capture a portion of that? We're not saying all, you know, eliminating outflow from the, from the field, but could we capture a portion of that, reduce the downstream delivery of those nutrients and use that water and nutrients as supplemental irrigation in our crop field? And uh, we've seen, you know, that we might be able to enhance our crop production out in the field. Uh, we have uh, a producer that's doing this near Story City, and over about six years of, of using that uh, supplemental irrigation on their corn crop, they've seen an average yield benefit of about 40 uh, bushel per acre per year in the years that they've used that supplemental irrigation. And that water that they've used has, we've kept from going downstream. So I think that's, that's kind of an emerging practice. Um, we still need to study whether it's economically beneficial for the farmer, um, you know, or, or how do we make it work. Also, I would say that one, we could apply that water back through a center pivot or back if we have this controlled drainage, we could think about putting it back into the drainage system as sub-irrigation. So that's uh, kind of where that, that might be a case where uh, that controlled drainage, um, if we put water back in as sub-irrigation, we might see some, some yield benefits. So I think, you know, um, there's kind of emerging research work in all of these areas, looking at how we best design these systems, how we best manage it, uh, and whether they're, especially in drainage water recycling, whether it's economically feasible out there as well. Well, thanks for giving us a picture of what's been happening in the field, uh, knowing that we've, we've made some changes, made some advancements, but we still have a long way to go uh, in terms of, of how we manage nitrate leaving the field. So Catherine, I'd like to, to chat with you a little bit about uh, as we think larger, think at the watershed scale, at the, the state of Iowa scale, how do you describe the current state of water quality? Yeah, it's a tough question. And it's tough because it, it really varies depending on the time of year and it varies depending on the year. We've talked about drought years, we've talked about wet years, and so that, that really makes a difference because obviously when it rains, we see more things wash out of the soil, wash off the pavement and into our waterways. So that has a big effect. Um, I also like to think about water quality in terms of how you interact with the water. Um, are you using it for recreation? Is it a drinking water source? That's a really important way to think about our water quality as well. But a, a great resource to help understand 
water quality in Iowa over time is the impaired waters listing. And I've shared with you all a, a graph that I like to use um, that shows um, um, the impaired water listing from 2004 to 2022. And this is something that's put out every year by the Department of Natural Resources. And they uh, look at how that water is used. Is it used as a recreation source? Is it used as a drinking water source? And they um, uh, use data to understand if it is considered um, healthy or if it has an impairment. So the, the main thing to, to see in this graph is that um, at the very top of the graph, we have a, a dark green area. That's the part, those are the water bodies that have met all water quality standards. Um, and so in Iowa, in 2022, we had 15 water body segments that met all water quality standards. Um, that's at about over 2,500 segments in Iowa. So 15 out of about 2,500 segments. The other parts of the graph look at um, areas where we don't have the data. We need more people, we need more data to understand and assess that water quality. So in light green, we have areas that um, we don't have the data on, but we think that there is likely, this is a healthy stream. Whereas in pink with um, white dots, that's areas where, again, we don't have the data, but it looks like there's some sort of impairment. And so the main thing to see there is that the vast majority of our water body segments, over 1,500, um, are likely impaired, but we're, we're not really sure. Um, in dark pink is areas where um, we have an impairment, but we have a plan in place to deal with that. And then in dark red, those are our impaired waters. So in Iowa, we've got 597 segments that are impaired. So the main thing to take away is that um, the vast majority of our water bodies in Iowa are impaired, and we have about 15 out of 2,500 that are not impaired. Um, so there's lots of room for improvement. Um, the main uh, issues that we see, um, according to the impaired water listings in our, in our rivers and streams, is bacteria. That's a big issue, and that usually comes from human and animal sources. Um, but Matt also talked about nitrates. Um, and that's certainly important, that's an important thing to consider, but you wouldn't necessarily see that reflected in the impaired water listing because nitrogen is only considered a direct pollutant if it's a drinking water source. So impairment doesn't always mean unsafe. It really depends on the use um, or the purpose um, for that particular water body. Yeah, exactly. They look at uh, if it's used for fishing, if it's used for swimming, are they harvesting fish from it, is it a drinking water source? So yes, if it is a drinking water source, then they evaluate nitrogen because that can have um, some negative human health effects if, if you drink high uh, water with high nitrate. Um, but it really depends on the use. So if, you, if you're looking at it for aquatic species, you might look at the oxygen level in the water and things like that. Where can Iowans go to learn more, right? right? Learn more about their water quality and, and, and the various things playing into it. Yeah, uh, great question. So um, a great resource that we have here at Iowa State is the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy Dashboard. So this is essentially a website, um, but it's a way for you to explore um, water quality across the state, but also the number of practices that we've adopted across the state. Um, so the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, as a reminder, is our statewide strategy to help reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus ending up in our waterways. And in 2023, we observed the 10 year um, anniversary of that strategy. So it's really focused on nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and the main reason is because those really have negative impacts on water quality downstream in the state, but also in other states. Um, so nitrogen, this is something that Matt talked about that largely moves um, with water, whereas phosphorus, like you mentioned, largely moves with erosion. Um, so Nitrogen can lead to algal blooms. It can also be a hazard for drinking water. Phosphorus can also lead to algal blooms and it can have some negative impacts on aquatic life when we think of really cloudy water, water that has a lot of sediment in it. Um, so, you know, I get asked a lot, like, are we making progress? And it, it's a tough question to answer, but um, the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy looks at the number of practices that has been adopted and, and tries to understand um, what impact that would have on water quality. Um, and so by our estimates on phosphorus, the good news is that yes, we are making progress. And then you talked about reduced tillage. A lot of it is due to folks adopting reduced tillage practices. The bad news is that we're, we're really not making progress on nitrogen. Um, 
And that can be, that's due to a lot of things, different cropping systems, but we are seeing that the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that's being applied is increasing. We're seeing that have a negative impact on water quality. So um, like you both mentioned, we need more people to think about nitrogen reducing practices. So um, good nitrogen management, but also cover crops and edge of field practices like wetlands and saturated buffers. So we've, we've talked about some uh, great resources that we have in the state, soil and water, and now we'll move on to wildlife with Adam. So Adam, could you tell us um, what are some major um, concerns and challenges related to wildlife populations in Iowa? Yeah, first, I thought it'd just be fun to just like start with, what are we talking about when we say wildlife? Because I think oftentimes people have a different picture in their mind for what is wildlife. And so uh, what are we talking about for wildlife in Iowa? Uh, we have something like around 50 to 60 different species of mammals some in the sort of same neighborhood 40 to 50 species of reptiles and amphibians 100 species of butterflies birds is complicated because we have oh, like a hundred and I don't know between around 200 probably breeding birds and then an equal number or more that migrate through our state during different times of the year from uh, breeding areas way in the north all the way up to the Arctic Circle and wintering areas as far south as Argentina. Um, we have thousands of species of moths. Did I say 100 species of butterflies? We have like all this biological <laughs> diversity. And oh, freshwater mussels, um, all, insects, all sorts of biological diversity. So what are we talking about when we say wildlife? Um, I always just kind of say like, I don't, any free-ranging animal that nobody owns, uh, then thus we all own. So we all have a stake in wildlife and wildlife conservation. We uh, enjoy the aesthetic beauty that they provide, recreational opportunities, they fuel economies across the state through tourism um, or um, outdoor recreation and comparable things. So um, that's what we're talking about when we say wildlife. And when you have all of that diversity, answering the question like what are wildlife doing in the state is pretty challenging. Some species of wildlife are thriving and those are species that we think of as kind of being able to adapt alongside people. Uh, think particularly in urban environments, we have species that do well and have adapted to living alongside in urban environments or really resilient species that live in rural landscapes uh, as well. An example that comes to mind is the Vesper Sparrow. The Vesper Sparrow actually nests in crop fields. It's one of the few species of animals that directly benefit from croplands. And so Vesper Sparrows are doing pretty well in Iowa, but there's a lot of species that are struggling. And so uh, as we're talking today, we're talking mostly about agriculture in environmental stewardship. And so I'm gonna talk mostly about farmland wildlife, but I thought some species that might make a cool point about additional challenges that we have with wildlife are three of Iowa's four venomous snakes. Uh, I like to just like steer right into the sort of controversial stuff sometimes. And it's pretty cool that we have four species of venomous snakes in Iowa. And three of these species are all rattlesnakes. And um, they each, interestingly, the three species of rattlesnakes that we have in the state each occupy the three major ecosystems we have in the state. We have a forest dwelling rattlesnake called the timber rattlesnake that is actually doing the best. It's relatively common in southern and eastern Iowa, though it has certainly some threats. We have a, a grassland dwelling rattlesnake that historically would have been widely distributed throughout the state, but today is just restricted to a few small grassland areas, basically in the Lust Hills of western Iowa, called the prairie rattlesnake. And then we have a wetland dwelling rattlesnake, which is the most rare it's designated as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act, and it just lives in large wetlands in eastern Iowa. Now, the reason I wanted to use these as an example is to say the decisions we make on our farms largely don't impact super rare species or highly specialized species like these rattlesnakes. So we have in that long list of species that I just mentioned, we have lots of species that basically just care what happens in forests. Um, we have species that just care what happens in large expansion, expanses of native grasslands. And then we have species that just care about what happens in large wetlands. And so when I started with all that biological diversity, now let's take all of those off and talk about farmland wildlife specifically. And there's actually a lot. There's a lot of species that sort of ebb and flow with the decisions that we make on our farms. And what I like to talk about in my education with farmers and landowners in Iowa is to think about how every decision we make on the farm could have impacts. And in many cases, positive impacts when we talk about things like 
edge of field practices or even infield practices uh, that clean up the water and improve conditions for aquatic wildlife downstream. So what are some of the farmland wildlife trends that you're seeing? Are you seeing new species that maybe we haven't seen for many years or some of the tried and true, are they, they holding steady? Yeah, some, I mean, again, when we have all this diversity, like you can always find winners and losers. Um, I would say in the aggregate wildlife, farmland wildlife in Iowa are struggling. And that's driven primarily by the loss of diversity in our agricultural landscapes. So I have a slide that we can pull up here that shows just land use change across um, a bunch, uh, three different townships distributed throughout Iowa. And what you can just see by looking at this is the reduction in diversity of land use types. It's funny when I listen to you all talk about like water and soil and stuff and you're talking about crop rotations and you know perennial systems and third crops and all this stuff, those same factors would benefit wildlife because wildlife benefit from diverse land uses. Um, we've also seen, you see in this slide, um, the expansion of field sizes. So we used to have smaller fields, smaller equipment, more diverse crop rotations. The equipment used to run on perennial forages and today it runs on diesel fuel, you know, like if we think way back in terms of like uh, livestock that pulled equipment. Um, and wildlife, farmland wildlife specifically were the beneficiaries of that. And so the factors that trend towards homogenization, like just everything is the same in Iowa's agricultural landscapes, and um, intensification, so like the only thing growing in crop fields today is just corn or soybeans, benefits the farmer, it's presented some challenges for wildlife. The classic example, this is a monarch butterfly, and so we see long-term trends, and we don't even have long-term uh, data really for this species, but just even back to the 90s, uh, with the introduction of Roundup Ready crops and the like, we know we've lost a lot of milkweed and also nectar resources that uh, sustain the monarchs. And we suspect that their populations used to be much larger um, and historical records indicate that as well. And so monarch butterfly populations have trended negatively. Also grassland bird populations have trended negatively. Again, grassland birds would have benefited from small grains and also the perennial forages that uh, ran the livestock, the livestock equipment we used to use on our farms. And so grassland bird populations just since the 1970s in North America have just have declined by 50%. It's the most rapid declining population we've seen uh, among all bird guilds. And so we have some serious challenges in agricultural landscapes. But the good news is the types of things that you all are talking about wetlands to slow down and treat nitrate, um, uh, perennial vegetation strategically integrated into our crop fields to reduce soil erosion or to retain nitrogen, um, oxbow restoration, um, riparian buffers, like all of this stuff, it's all good for wildlife. And so if we clean up our act, so to speak, when it comes to water and soil in agricultural landscapes, it's really likely that we'll see a resurgence of many of these farmland wildlife species as well, that would be kind of a win-win for everybody. So Adam, you've talked a little bit about the monarch butterfly and some of the restoring um, or habitat restoration efforts that have helped improve things. Are there other species that we've focused on, like the monarch, that we've made um, some progress on? Yeah. So. Great question and a fun one to answer. We, of course, have uh, success stories. And if we go back to my example of the rattlesnakes and the different ecosystems, we've had some uh, ecosystem success stories in Iowa. And one that I like to um, herald is the trumpeter swan. I almost said trumpet, but I decided to say herald. Uh, herald the trumpeter swan. Uh, the trumpeter swan uh, was extirpated in Iowa. It's extirpated in Iowa for the same reasons that many species of wildlife were driven away from Iowa at the time of European colonization, they were uh, shot in a way that was totally unregulated. So people were just killing these things indiscriminately without any sort of regulation like we have today with hunting. And then they were also um, impacted by extensive drainage, widespread loss. And so trumpeter swans like relatively large semi-permanent wetlands. So think wetlands with cattails and um, scattered open water and things like that. And uh, wildlife biologists and 
uh, county conservation boards and farmers and landowners and others have been restoring wetlands like this in marginal cropland in Iowa since the early 1900s. And um, once a critical mass of those wetlands were restored, trumpeter swans were reintroduced into our state. They captured a couple of swans from some other state and they threw them in a truck and drove them to a wetland that had been restored here in Iowa and let them go. And trumpeter swans have really done well. So you all, we all can see this, like drive around. I just saw a pair of trumpeter swans yesterday. Um, you can see wintering trumpeter swans up and down the river systems. Uh, and then all summer long, you can see trumpeter swans breeding on Iowa's wetlands. And in many of many people's lifetimes, that wouldn't have been um, something that they would have seen. So it's this cool, really conspicuous case of uh, to take the Iowa movie reference. If you build it, they will come. If you put these wetlands back into these landscapes, uh, wetland dependent wildlife like trumpeter swans and others will benefit from it. And we think, again, we're kind of poised for. Um, uh, comparable achievements with many other species of farmland wildlife, like the monarch butterfly or things like that. All right. Well, it's great to hear from everyone and, and get um, to dig deep in, into a, a few areas that you're working in. Uh, we'll transition now to a little bit faster pace. Uh, so I'm going to start with Mark, and uh, I, I want to know from each of you, what system or practice has a lot of potential to protect natural resources while also balancing agricultural productivity. So from your um, area that you work in, what do you see some great promise in? Yeah, so I, one of the areas that I'm starting to do a little bit more research in, um, not that it's necessarily new, but it's it's got a new um, kind of lease on life type mentality, is uh, the use of relay cropping. So we know that um, cover crops and small grains have a lot of benefit from the, the nutrient loss perspective but can we get some added value out of them, say if we if we start you know harvesting them, but yet still not sacrifice our soybean production, right? And so the the idea behind that is is you know we'd plant those small grains in the fall, then we'd plant soybeans into them in oh probably mid to late April, harvest the small grain uh, late June into July, and then harvest the soybeans in the fall. So really looking at kind of three crop harvests within two years, right? And the hope is, is that we get, you know, we maintain the water quality benefits that we, you know, we would normally think of with a small grain cover crop, right? Um, and so really trying to put some some economics back into, you know, a practice that's gonna help us, you know, both in the, the water quality and the productivity, um, right? So uh, it's kind of exciting um, to, to kind of start looking at things from that perspective again. Um, I, kind of a, a riff on that a little bit is with the increased uh, um, interest in things like renewable uh, diesels, right? Um, obviously, soybeans and other oil seeds are going to become of more interest, right? And so um, we can kind of um, play with that relay cropping a little bit or even double cropping and seeing where oil seeds and, and soybeans can be grown either at the same time or one following another. And, and again, that's another area that we're just starting to get into, but I think it'll be an area that, that could help us on a number of, ben, you know, number of these benefits that we're really looking for. Excellent, excellent. So Catherine, same question. Where do you see some, some promise? It's hard to choose. Um, I, I think I'll go with cover crops. Um, you know, corn and soybeans are obviously our predominant crop here in Iowa, but they are summer annual crops. You know, that means that they only actively grow on the landscape for part of the year. And we see, um, you know, the biggest sort of damage to our water quality um, in terms of nitrates done in the spring. Um, and so anything that we can do to have some living roots in the ground in the spring. So cover crops are a great example. You know, maybe it's um, a third crop or bringing small grains or clover back to the landscape. I think there's lots of opportunities there, but anything we can do to have living roots in the ground in the spring, at the heels of the year in the spring and the fall, I think would be great. Excellent. Adam, what yeah. would you like to see? One thing that really excites me is the sort of intersections between a lot of things we've been talking about today and like um, farm profitability or farm resiliency. And so um, we're not talking about you know, taking the most profitable acres in the farm out of production and putting them into prairie, say, to help, 
the monarch. Now, if a landowner wants to do that, have at it. But we're talking about uh, the greatest opportunities we see for wildlife conservation and agricultural landscapes might be to reimagine certain uses of our farms in areas where we have not been maybe profitable. Uh, some examples of that, uh, we can pull a picture up on a screen here of a farm up in uh, north central Iowa that Nathan, our friend Nathan Anderson farms. And uh, he was farming adjacent to the, the stream that goes through his property and a uh, major flood event kind of gave him a light bulb moment of like, why, why farm right up to the edge of the stream when I know I'm consistently having these flooding challenges? And so he worked with the local farm services agency and enrolled that land in the conservation reserve program adjacent to the creek. And now he, in doing so, he's increased the resiliency of that area of his farm. He reduces flooding loss and he's increasing the net profitability of the acres that he is farming. And we see opportunities for this all across farms, all across Iowa. Uh, highly eroded hillsides may not be worth continuing to put inputs into, and we can plant them in diverse native perennial vegetation and get lots of environmental benefits, including reduced soil erosion, reduced nitrate loss, and also uh, wildlife habitat. We can do it in flood prone areas, like on Nathan's farm, it was adjacent to a river and stream, but all across north central Iowa, we have depressional areas that are just really hard to farm and they flood consistently, especially with major spring precipitation events that we see uh, with the changing climate. Uh, so we could do it in potholes. We could even do it on like the edges of field where, where we have been driving heavy equipment for a hundred years and that soil is super compacted and we just can't really get a crop out of it. Uh, those highly compacted areas or old old barn lots. I mean, there's there's tons of opportunity areas when we look out across our fields. If we get people to think beyond just the traditional field edge and think about where within that field are you profitable and then finding areas where you're consistently not profitable and converting them to diverse native perennial vegetation. We always say that because it's important to get the most out of these areas. We can plant them into uh, native vegetation like prairie and, and uh, provide a lot of environmental good and also provide some um, economic returns to the farmer and landowner. So I, I get to go last and uh, everybody's, yeah, yeah. everybody's <laughs> talked about some really important things that I'm like, Catherine, how do I choose just one? Um, I guess I Couple couple things. I'm not going to say just one. But I'm going to maybe amplify what what Mark and and Catherine said. Is you know I think with cover crops, uh, or thinking of a winter biomass uh, crop, there may be some some benefits there. You know I'm really intrigued if we can think about how can we use that for forage for livestock. You know in in certain areas to get some added added economic value maybe for the producer while still getting the environmental benefit. And then there's work looking at maybe harvesting that, that cover crop biomass for uh, things like anaerobic digestion. So maybe there's some opportunities for some, some economic return from uh, that cover crop that, that we, we um, expect to provide us environmental benefits. I'll also go back to our drainage water recycling concept because I think that there's there's the potential there of, of enhancing agricultural productivity. You know, really interested to see, you know, do these these areas that we're storing water provide any other, um, you know, value for, you know, on the landscape, thinking about what, what Adam talked about. You know, they may not be quite as, um, quite as natural as some of our wet, wetland systems, but they may be, um, at least some of them, you know, semi-permanent uh, pools of, of water, but we may not have, you know, maybe deeper water systems rather than shallow water. So they may not provide all those benefits, but do they provide it, any other uh, benefits out there? There are even some people have thought about floating uh, photovoltaics on these on these uh, storage areas. I don't know if that would take off, but, uh, you know, something to, to think about, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, I have colleagues working on perennial ground cover. So kind of a, a bluegrass that, you know, grows perennially uh, under that corn or soybean crop. So I think there are a lot of, you know, kind of cool emerging um, practices that that are that are out there and uh you know excited to see what happens as Catherine said it's 10 year of the Iowa nutrient reduction strategy what happens with some of these over the next 10 years it's exciting to think about yeah okay so on to the next one what are you most excited about in the area of, of conservation 
Um, so we talked about some exciting things already, so you have to dig a little deeper. Could be emerging research, it could be tools, it could be efforts that you're seeing in one part of the state that you'd love to see expand uh, beyond and, and really cover the entire state. So Adam, I'm gonna start with you for this one. What, what are you excited about? Yeah, I think I perceive there to be sort of a growing awareness and concern about these topics. Um, and I get that from my experience on farms. Uh, I always think of myself as kind of like the sideshow entertainment. Like Mark's going to show up and tell you how to like raise a crop. And Matt's going to show up and tell you how to install a drainage system and other things. And I'm just the wildlife guy there to talk about the things that exist on the margins of our farms. But I find that I consistently have an opportunity to have conversations with people about uh, the things that they're seeing on the farms and what they're asking for out of the landscapes in which they uh, live and work. And so um, sort of this growing awareness about the positive benefits that accrue when we sort of do right by the land, when we think about things beyond just this year's crop, when we think about long-term uh, conditions of the soil or the conditions of our friends and neighbors that live downstream and the drinking water that we're sending to them, uh, or even our friends and neighbors that live a world away that will uh, that are today hosting the monarch butterflies that we raised in uh, late summer and fall and today are found in Mexico. Um, just thinking in that sort of global context and then acting locally to find opportunities to diversify our landscapes by putting diverse native perennial vegetation out there, integrating edge of field conservation practices uh, into our farm. I just perceive there to be a growing uh, interest and recognition among farmers and landowners in the state. And I think it's our job to be the cheerleaders and chiefs for the people that are out on the vanguard of that, adopting these conservation practices and talking about all of the good that accrues to their farm beyond just the bushels, uh, the good in terms of improved soil health, the good in terms of improved biological diversity, improved recreational quality of life outcomes and things like that. So. I think that's kind of what gives me hope for this system. Awesome, awesome. All right, Matt. Okay, I didn't get to, didn't 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 go last on this. Um, I think there are a few things I think about that, and I'm not even going to go to any practices. But you know, do we are we implementing ways to kind of accelerate the rate of adoption of of kind of the tried and true or emerging practices. And I think we're I think we're doing that with things like the batch and build efforts of, you know, how do we make it easy for farmers to implement these practices, make it efficient, you know, and, and we've kind of had to build capacity in that area. You know, we have to have more people on the ground doing this work. I think that's exciting. There are more watershed coordinators, more people uh, involved with this, conservation agronomists folks. Um, and so, you know, that's where I'm most enthused is how do we how do we make this efficient for the farmer to implement because some of these don't don't have at least a short-term economic benefit. So how do we make it efficient? And I think there are efforts with the batch and build there. And then I'm excited that there are opportunities for some of our Iowa State University graduates to work in this space. And so, you know, have seen a number of our graduates from the Ag and Biosystems Engineering Department that are spending you know, the early part of their career probably will spend the most of their career in designing uh, wetland systems or designing, you know, uh, integrating water storage and, and wetland systems both in Iowa and, and other Midwestern states. So that's something I'm kind of excited about is to see, you know, that that future, um, you know, future work by some of the, the students that have come through through our program. Sure. Growing uh, conservation as an industry in yeah. our state. That's yeah, really growing exciting. conservation as an industry and, and then taking it, kind of spreading it to, to other states as well. Great, great. All right, Catherine, what's, what's exciting to you? Well, I'll build on what Matt said. I, I think the um, investment in people, um, you know, some of these systems that we're talking about are complicated and farmers need help to adop adopt them and shift to these systems. And so we see in the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy that the, the amount of investment in people and in technical assistance to help farmers is increasing. Um, and so we see that with watershed coordinators, folks who are employed by the Iowa Department of Agriculture, the Department of Natural Resources, out on the landscape helping farmers who often have additional access to cost share and things like that. And then we also see it very excitingly in conservation agronomists. 
um, this sort of new position that we're seeing a huge growth in. Um, folks who are employed by private retailers usually, but who have a lot of conservation expertise. And I think we're seeing retailers and other private groups see that something like cover crops is not outside of their business model, right? You can still sell the exact same amount of nitrogen, but now you've added another seed possibly to, to that. So I think the investment in people is, is really exciting and it's the foundation that we can build all these other things on. Great, great. Mark, last one. What's exciting? Last what, what are you looking forward to? I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of taking a systems thinking approach to cropping systems, right? And so I'm just as guilty as many other researchers. And, you know, we really get focused on, you know, looking at cereal rye cover crops ahead of corn or something like that, right? And and I know Matt's doing a little bit of this uh, work as well, but um, just thinking about, you know, if we want to use cover crops, if we want to use reduced nitrogen, if we want to use split nitrogen applications, uh, maybe even if we we want to do these things, right? Maybe we need to think about how we want to change or how we can change our crop production too, right? Do we change our maturity? Do we change our planting dates? Things like that to make this whole system work much more efficiently, right? Um, and, and, you know, we're all very conscious of, you know, profitability, um, you know, th that farmers have, but I think we're all trying to learn how do we do this uh, in, a, in a very efficient way. And, and I think now getting into the kind of that systems thinking process is kind of exciting, right? It, it's it, it's gonna help us hopefully get to that next level a lot easier. Right, thanks Mark. Yeah, it really is gonna take a, a system approach to all of this. There's not one practice, not one change that we make. Um, so all of us I know are, are heavily involved in that and thinking Cross disciplines, you know, all of us sitting in here today represent different disciplines, and I know we really enjoy working together and, and bringing those different ideas together and and thinking about how how we make this work, how we keep advancing and and addressing all of the goals that we have in Iowa for crop production, um, improving soils, improving water, improving habitat, um, increasing our wildlife populations. Uh, so uh, it's great to to end on that systems thinking note, Mark. Welcome back to the conservation conversation. Uh, when we first recorded with the rest of the crew, uh, Billy Beck wasn't able to join us, but we're so happy to have him here today to talk about forestry issues. So Billy Beck is an Extension Forestry Specialist and Assistant Professor with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And uh, we're happy to have him here to talk a bit about uh, forestry resources that we have in the state, some important issues related to forestry that we should be thinking about as landowners and operators. Um, so let's get started. So Billy, first question I have for you are, in what ways are forests being managed to balance both profitability and some of our conservation goals that we have in Iowa? The first thing I think of when I think about that is um, agricultural producers taking marginal land out of cultivation for a range of forestry practices um, that benefit their overall agricultural enterprise. So it can be something as uh, common as a tree planting, but also silvopasture, riparian forest buffers, um, nut tree plantings for personal use and diversification of income, um, and windbreaks as well, which have a myriad of benefits from pollinators to you know economic boosts on the farm. So for me, when I go across the state, that's a big one that I, I really look out for and appreciate when I see. Great, great. So silvopasture is one maybe not everybody's heard about. So could you tell us a bit about what silvopasture is? I will. So I am um, attempting to become knowledgeable on silvopasture. I am not an expert, but it's basically com combining grazing and um, forestry for the benefit of both. So. Um, Ashley Conway, Dr. Ashley Conway at the University of Missouri is a silvopasture ex expert. She's my, my go-to for that, for that subject. But it's fairly new in the Midwest. Um, there's a small group of us that get together and chat about it to see how we can incorporate that new extension and, and learn more. But um, I'm right on the tip of the iceberg of exploring silvopasture. But it's a great example of combining you know, how trees can benefit the, the overall farm enterprise. So. Excellent. Well, great to know that there may be more to come on silvopasture, and then uh, great to hear about all of the other ways that, that forests can be managed. Uh, so emerald ash borer and oak wilt are two issues that I am hearing more and more about um, that are of concern, uh, certainly to, to forest owners. Could you share the status about those two uh, issues and, and maybe where folks could get some information if they're new to those two issues? Yeah. 
So I'll start with Emerald Ash Borer. Um, unfortunately, it's been detected in almost all of Iowa's 99 counties, so the wave has, has spread through. Um, impacts all of our native ash species, green, white, blue, and black, uh, unfortunately. Um, no resistance has been found yet. Um, so it's really kind of forced our hand to diversify our urban and rural forest canopy. It's a really good teaching moment about diversification and the, the importance of that. Um, if they are interested, if folks are interested in getting more information about emerald ash borer, um, just do a quick search of Iowa State Natural Resource Stewardship Extension, emerald ash borer. We've got a great page that tells you how to treat for it, um, replacement species, how to identify it. Uh, and other things that you might want to know about about EAB, but it's here. Um, the wave has passed. It's it's come through Iowa, so we're gonna over the next 20 years. It should be interesting to see what happens with uh, that insect and the the ash population. So it's unfortunate that this is the way that it came about, but um, diversity is great. So the opportunity, if you know, that we're facing now is is not all bad. So it does give us an opportunity to to diversify. Yeah, silver lining. It's really a, a great you know punch in the face about we really need to diversify our, our urban and rural woodlands. So, All right, thanks. So what about oak wilt? Like emerald ash borer, it's been found statewide, oak wilt, and it's a vascular wilt. So it's a fungus that clogs up the tree's vascular system so they can't transport sap up and down and eventually killing the trees. And uh, red oaks are very susceptible to it. White oaks are, succep are susceptible to it, but not to the degree that, that red oaks are. So. Um, I'd say if you're a landowner and you're concerned about oak wilt, um, the first thing to do is really assess your woodlands. Walk your woodlands in the summer, mid to late summer, um, and you can uh, see on the slide there, you're looking for a rapid wilting of all the leaves on the tree, and they rapidly fall down and make this big pile or carpet right under the, right under the, the canopy there. So that's one thing to look for in the, in the summer to identify oak wilt. And often, happens in pockets because one of the ways it's transmitted is through the roots of oaks. When they touch each other, they graft and join so that fungus can get through the roots and get to its, its quick, uh, quickly to its neighbors. So with oak wilt, one concern that we're having is it's spread through wounding of oak trees in the growing season. So that wound produces sap. The beetles that carry the fungal spores are attracted to that sap, and then that's an entry point for, for oak wilt. So with the extreme weather events that we're seeing more and more, uh, the derecho in 2020 was a good example, um, we're getting very concerned that oak wilt could, uh, could um, become exacerbated around the state. So we got lucky in 2020 because the derecho was fairly late into the growing season, but with what's been going on with the weather, we're, we're concerned. So meeting with a forester, assessing your woodlands, you can have a strategy to, to get ahead of that. So Great, great, thank you. So you mentioned the derecho. That's another uh, topic that comes up when you're talking to woodland owners and, and communities that were in the path of that storm. How are our communities and individual landowners recovering from the damage? That was a, a big storm and really affected a lot of people in different ways. Yeah, and honestly, like we get pockets of storm damage all over the state, but this was a, quite the event. Uh, and I'll kind of focus on more of the rural woodlands, what's going on there. And it really, um, again, like Emerald Ash Borer, it forced our hand to kind of start thinking about forest management of these areas. So the big physiological thing it did was it opened up the canopy of you know, thousands of acres of woodlands across the state, that swath in central Iowa. And when it did that, it provided a lot of new sunlight for the regeneration underneath. So a lesson was that folks that were actively managing their woodlands and had the regeneration that they wanted, like young oaks, for example, kind of benefited, and I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but they benefited from that canopy opening. It reinvigorated and gave sunlight to that young reg regeneration. But most folks, unfortunately, had invasive species. You know, they were passively managing their woodlands, and now those invasive species are taking full advantage of uh, that new sunlight. So directly after the derecho, there was some federal funding for recovery, but now the foresters out on the ground are just going back to the, the equips and the other uh, programs out there that are getting folks on board with forest management and recovery, so. Great, so 
again, little silver lining that, that some landowners found out of that. It's yep. great to hear that there, there were some positives that came out of it, but also uh, those that maybe saw that they could be managing a little bit differently and be more prepared for those big events. Um, for those landowners and farmers, what advice do you have for them as they get started in managing their woodlands? I'd say the number one thing to do, the first thing to do is really think about your goals. Um, think about what you want out of your woodlands. Uh, think about the future. Are you wanting to pass that along to your, your children or, or donate it to a, a conservation easement? But we get asked a lot, what do I do here? What's the right thing to do? Well, there's not one right thing to do. It's really based on your goals and what you get, want to get out of your woodland. So really think about that, uh, about what your goals are and have them be like, you know, the smart goals. You know what I'm saying? Like specific time-bound goals that you want to achieve. Then visit with a professional forester to start talking about, okay, how can I achieve those goals through management on my land? If you're brand new to the game, those are the two things I would really recommend. Where would a landowner go to find a professional forester? Ah, great question. So if you Google or search, um, if you search on for natural resource stewardship, Iowa State Extension, we have a natural resource contacts page where it's a clickable county map you click your county and you can see all the professionals that serve that, that county. And we've got you know, water quality professionals, wildlife professionals, um, and of course, forestry professionals. So you click your county, you can see the public and private foresters and contractors uh, that serve your county. Great, so. excellent resource for all sorts of things and especially finding that, that forester to help you. All right, so we're gonna move on to a little bit of a, a speed round, I guess, Ooh. of questions. So. Uh, what system or practice uh, has a lot of potential to protect natural resources while also balancing agricultural productivity? I know this is old school and it's not like cutting edge or anything, but I really, um, one that I really love and I'm, I'm getting excited about is windbreaks. Uh, and not just windbreaks around farmsteads, but windbreaks for grazing paddocks and windbreaks for crop field. Um, not only do they prevent you know, wind erosion from the soil, um, not only do they add you know, weight gains for livestock, not only do they have a, a yield boost for crop fields, not only do they have you know, energy savings for the homeowner and the farmstead, not only do they increase PR or you know, encourage PR with uh, animal facilities with you know, odor emissions and reduction in those, but they're, uh, in a, they're an oasis of um, pollinator benefit and wildlife habitat in, a, in, a, in, a, in the agricultural landscape. And even recently too, you know, more and more people are establishing these, establishing these because they want to see wildlife close to their house and they just want that mental health, beauty, aesthetic on the landscape next to their, their property that lately I think would be a huge, <laughs> a huge benefit. So I know it's old school, but um, I really think there's a huge potential out there for windbreaks to do not just block the wind, but do all these other compound provide all these other compound benefits. Yeah, I think we go right to the name and think, okay, that's its benefit, you yeah. know, it's a windbreak, but it's great to think about all the other things that it can bring to your farm and and really provide generations of, of those benefits. Yeah. It's planted once, it lasts for, how you know, what's the lifespan of a typical windbreak? That's an interesting thing that I think um, a lot of folks don't really grasp is that these things have a lifespan and they need to be rejuvenated I would say between 50 and 70 years, you, you really need to start thinking about regener um, renovation of, of a windbreak. And that depends on your species and what the purpose of the windbreak is. But Excellent, well, think about windbreaks. Definitely put that on your, your goal list as you think about it. So what are you most excited about? I mean, you, you get excited about a lot of things, so this I might do. be hard to yeah, hone down on. <laughs> but what are you most excited about in the area of conservation? It could be emerging research, a new practice, some policy changes, anything that you're seeing maybe gain momentum, what brings you some excitement? Um, I will say three things, and they're more on the programmatic side of things, but I think they're very exciting. Um, the first one is the Forest Legacy Program. This is a conservation easement um, associated with the U.S. Forest Service that is seeking to protect woodlands that are at risk of conversion. So around our large um, metropolitan areas, those woodlands are what it's kind of aimed at, at protecting. So it's really getting up, led by the Iowa DNR, administered by the Iowa DNR in this state. Um, it's kind of ramping up right now. And it's been very exciting to see properties go in under this. So private ownership, 
but they have this easement to protect the woodland. Yes. Through uh, the USDA Forest Service. Yep, yep. Okay. So it's, it's keeping their conservation goals on the ground, ensuring it will never be developed, uh, but they still own the land. Yep. So and they can still use it uh, for what they need. So Excellent. very excited for that. Okay, number uh, two. Number two, yes. <laughs> now programs ebb and flow, and I, I'd like to make this you know timeless a timeless video, but the point of this is always reach out to your USDA service center and your professional foresters for what's going on out there. But one really neat one now that's coming up is the Conservation Stewardship Program, um, CSP. So one neat thing about this, it's open to everyone, but it's really aimed at kind of giving a, a reward or some, some extra opportunity to folks that are already doing great conservation. So it's like, hey, here's some bonus things you can do on your land. And it's a wide range of things. Everything from like tree planting, wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat. I mean, it's just a, a very, very wide range. Um, so that's very exciting Excellent. for me. The NRCS in Iowa is on the brink of hiring a state forester. Oh, excellent. So. Uh, we haven't had one in a while, so this person is going to be uh, critical in getting those programs to Iowa and seeing that they're effectively uh, put on the ground. So, Wonderful. Not that they're not already, but this is just going to be huge for, for forestry conservation in the state. Wonderful. So, yeah, yeah. Forest, or not only forestry, but all conservation takes people, and yes. so it's wonderful to always have more capacity in those areas to administer those programs and, and make sure that that information and and resources are getting to landowners yeah. as they're making those decisions. So this is big, so I'm excited. All right, well thank you, Billy. It's been great uh, having you uh, in the studio and, and recording. We're sorry you couldn't be with the rest of the group, but it's great to capture this and, and have this be a part of the conservation conversation. All right, thank you for joining us today for the conservation conversation. Be sure to check out the great resources below that were referenced throughout the conversation uh, today and with the re recording with the larger group. Thank you.